section fourteen of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson section fourteen the defence seventh day continued i will first inquire whether the symptoms with which cook was attacked and the appearances presented by his body after death were consistent with the theory of his having died by strychnia poison and inconsistent with that of his having died from some other natural cause it is under this head that i shall discuss i hope not unduly the medical evidence in this case and present to you such observations as occurred to me on the witnesses who have been called to support the view which the crown takes of the effect of that medical testimony cook died at one o'clock in the morning of wednesday november twenty first in the presence of jones it was no sooner light than jones posted to town and saw his stepfather mr stevens mr stevens went down to rugeley and was introduced to palmer palmer went with him to the talbot arms and uncovered the corpse a bold thing to do if he had murdered him the body was so little emaciated or affected by disease that stevens wondered he could be dead but he observed some little rigidity about the muscles stevens's suspicions were roused he asked palmer to dinner questioned him about the betting book got angry that it was not produced dissembled with palmer cross-examined him went up to town met him at euston square again at wolverton at rugby and at rugeley at last he gave him to understand that he suspected him and intended to probe the whole matter to the bottom he resolved to have a post-mortem examination and that examination took place the appearances presented by the body after death were such as might have been anticipated by those who were acquainted with his course of life his general health his pursuits and not to say anything hard of him his vices and the drinking racing company which he kept his father had died at thirty years of age his mother about the same age a few years after her second marriage his sister was dead and he himself was affected with a pulmonary disorder cook had been suffering for a long time from a sore throat and bore about him all the signs and indications of having led a licentious life indeed he appears to have been about as dissipated a young man as can be well imagined i do not mean to say that he was utterly depraved or that he was lost to all sense of honour and propriety but it does not admit of doubt that his manner of living was wild riotous and extravagant his complaints indicated his excesses and he was avowedly addicted to pursuits the reverse of commendable when his body was opened there was evidence of a soreness of the tongue i do not go to the length of saying that there was anything to lead to the inference that there was an actual sore at the time of death but there were follicles and symptoms if not of a recent certainly of a not very remote ulcer the inside of the mouth had been ulcerated and the skin taken off on both sides there is abundant evidence to show that cook was himself of opinion that these symptoms were syphilitic he could scarcely be persuaded to obey the instructions of dr savage the respectable and very competent physician whom he consulted and though it is admitted that he was not fool enough to go to quack doctors it is very certain that he was weak enough to follow the counsels of every medical man who would venture to give him advice when coincided with his own opinion that mercury was the best thing for his complaint the spots which are the fatal characteristics of his dreadful malady had already made their appearance on his body and he was haunted by the apprehension that some day as he was running about the race-course his face would be suddenly covered over with copper blotches which would leave no doubt on the minds of those who saw them as to the nature of his disease many a man similarly affected has retrieved his position redeemed his character and become a virtuous member of society far be it from me then to say one word that would press with undue severity on the memory of the dead but no false delicacy shall deter me from the discharge of my duty 
and i make these remarks not in an unkind or censorious spirit but for the sake of truth and because the state of cook's health is a most important element in this inquiry it is certain that it was his own opinion that he was suffering from virulent syphilis and in this opinion the medical men who originally attended him did not hesitate to concur that he did not correct his habits is evident from the fact that within a recent period of his death he had again become diseased when his body was opened on the second examination there were found between the delicate membrane which the spinal marrow covers and is called the arachnoid and embedded to some extent in the next covering not so delicate termed the dogma mater granules about one inch in extent and i will satisfy you upon the evidence of witnesses whose authority will not be questioned that if the body had been opened in the dead house of any hospital in this metropolis those granules would have been regarded as symptoms affording conclusive explanation of the cause of death such then was the condition of cook's health a condition but partially and imperfectly revealed by the first post-mortem examination that examination was not conducted with the same minuteness and precision that circumstances rendered necessary on a subsequent occasion and the syphilitic disease was neither ascertained nor suspected the stomach was taken out and you have heard the suggestion which were it not that the court has ruled it to be of no significance i should have been prepared to disprove that palmer attempted to interfere with the operation by shoving against the medical man engaged in it the inference sought to be deduced was that some of the stomach escaped from the jar but we have the evidence of dr devonshire himself that such was not the fact none of it did escape and it was sent up in its entirety to london there to be analysed by dr taylor and dr rees those gentlemen examined it with the knowledge that owing to the report of palmer having purchased a fatal drug from mr roberts on the day of the death there was a suspicion of foul play mr stevens talked of the fact to dr taylor and with the consciousness of it on his mind that gentleman wrote a letter attributing the death to antimony dr taylor intimated dissent well if the letter is not to be so understood it is at all events susceptible of this interpretation that the death may have been caused by antimony dr taylor attends the coroner's inquest which in all probability is held in consequence of his own letter he hears the evidence of jones roberts and mills and it is but natural to presume that these are the witnesses whose testimony has the greatest influence on his opinion he forms his judgment on the evidence of chambermaids waitresses and housekeepers and contrary to the opinion of the medical man who attended cook in his last illness for be it remembered he had no encouragement from mr jones the surgeon of lutterworth a man of age and character to form a sound decision on the case he comes boldly and at once to the conclusion that his original notion about antimony having been the cause of death was a mistake and then he has the incredible imprudence an imprudence which has necessitated this trial or at all events rendered it necessary that it should take place in this form and place to declare upon his oath to the coroner's jury that he believes that the pills given to cook on monday and tuesday contained strychnine and the cook was consequently poisoned that evidence of his is carried on the wings of the press into every house in the united kingdom it becomes known throughout the length and breadth of the land that dr taylor a man who has devoted his life to science a man of the highest personal character and who stands well with his medical friends has declared not as a conjectural opinion mark you nor as a reserved opinion delivered in a private room to a few men whose discretion might be relied on but that in the public room of a public inn in a little public village where everything that occurs is known he has declared upon his solemn oath that it is his belief that cook died because those pills containing strychnine 
were administered to him on the nights of monday and tuesday he had himself failed to discover the faintest traces of strychnine yet at the coroner's inquest he had the hardihood to declare his conviction that the pills contained strychnine and that cook died of them his evidence is neither consistent with itself nor with the opinion of mr jones he takes it upon him to pronounce positively in the face of the world that cook's disease was nothing else than tetanus and tetanus too of the kind that can be produced by poison only and that poison strychnine such was dr taylor's testimony and on such testimony the coroner's jury returned their verdict but merciful heaven in what position are we placed for the safety of our own lives and those of our families if on evidence such as this men are to be put on their trial for foul murder as often as a sudden death occurs in any household if science is to be allowed to come and dogmatize in our courts and not science that is successful in its operations or exact in its nature but science that is baffled by its own tests and bears upon its forehead the motto a little learning is a dangerous thing if i say science such as this is to be suffered to dogmatize in our courts and to utter judgment which its own processes fail to vindicate life is no longer secure and there is thrown upon judges and jurymen a weight of responsibility too grievous for human nature to endure if dr taylor had detected the poison by his own tests he with his long experience in toxicological studies would have been an excellent witness for the crown but he has not found the poison and not having seen the patient and knowing nothing of his deathbed symptoms beyond what he gathered from the evidence of an ignorant servant girl and of mr jones whose testimony does not show that he agrees with him in opinion dr taylor thinks himself justified in declaring upon his oath in a public court that the pills contain strychnine and that cook was poisoned if verdicts are to be moulded on testimony such as this what medical practitioner is safe on what ground does dr taylor vindicate his opinion he does not appear to have seen one solitary case of strychnine in the human subject yet with the full knowledge that the consequences of his assertion might be disastrous to the prisoner at the bar he has the audacity to assert that the pills which for anything he knows to the contrary were the same that dr bamford prepared contained strychnine and that cook was poisoned by it i have quoted the sentiment a little learning is a dangerous thing and assuredly to no science is that maxim so applicable as to the medical of all god's works there is no other which so eloquently attests our entire dependence on him and our own nothingness as that mortal coil in which we live and breathe and have our being we are struck with amazement as we contemplate it we feel we see we hear yet the instant we attempt to give a reason for these sensations our path is crossed by the mystery of creation and all we know is that god created man that he is our omnipotent maker and we the work of his hands yet we fancy that we can penetrate all mysteries and there are no bounds to our arrogance there has been much talk in this inquiry of the two kinds of tetanus idiopathic and traumatic dr todd urged by the court to explain the former described it as constitutional perhaps self-generating would have done as well but let that pass but how is our knowledge advanced by translating idiopathic as constitutional it is easy to give an english translation of that greek compound but the thing is to explain what the translation means what is the meaning of the phrase constitutional tetanus lord campbell tetanus not occasioned by external injury mr sergeant sheen just so my lord or in other words tetanus not referable to any known cause but in truth idiopathic means in general sense unaccountable not that constitutional tetanus is always and invariably so 
but that cases of tetanus do continually occur of which you can only suspect the cause and attribute it by hypothesis to a cold or some other vague accident in such cases you say that the disease is idiopathic and not traumatic the crown will have it that cook's was the tetanus of poison but it is almost an assumption to say that it was tetanus at all that he died of convulsions or immediately after them is certain and that they were convulsions similar to those from which he suffered on the preceding night is beyond all doubt but what pretence is there for positively asserting that they were tetanus at all the evidence of mr jones fairly interpreted cannot be construed otherwise than as intimating an impression that they were convulsions which partook of the tetanic character that might be and yet the malady might not be tetanus it is bad reasoning most defective logic to argue without positive proof of the fact that the disease was tetanus and no other tetanus in the world than that produced by poison following in the trail dragged for them by the toxicologists the crown have thought proper to impute the death of this man to the poison of strychnine it is for them to prove the fact we contest it but it by no means follows that we should be bound to explain the death on other grounds we can satisfy you that this man was assailed by any one of the numerous kinds of convulsions to which humanity is liable and that he was asphyxiated or deprived of life when writhing in some sudden spasm or paroxysm we shall have done all that can in fairness be demanded of us unless indeed the crown shall be prepared to prove that cook's symptoms were irreconcilable with any other doctrine than that of death by strychnine this they have not done and cannot do i propose to call your attention to the statements of the witnesses mills and jones with respect to the symptoms which they observed in cook on the evenings of monday and tuesday and having done so i will submit to your candid judgment whether those symptoms may not be more naturally accounted for by attributing them to convulsions which are not tetanic at all and most assuredly not tetanic in the distinctive character of strychnine but which may rather be classed under those ordinary convulsions by means of which it constantly pleases providence to strike men down without leaving upon their bodies the faintest indications from which the cause of death may be inferred you have it upon the authority of medical men of the highest distinction that it sometimes occurred that men in the prime of life and in the full vigour of health are smitten to death by convulsions that leave no trace upon the body of the sufferer the statements mills and jones are such as to render it entirely unnecessary to resort to the hypothesis of any kind of tetanus much less to that of strychnine in accounting for the death of cook regard being had to the delicate state of his health and to the continually recurring derangement of his constitution it is far safer to conclude that he died of ordinary convulsions than of any description of tetanus whether traumatic idiopathic or that produced by poison nor must we omit to inquire into the state of his mind he went to shrewsbury races on the imminent peril of returning from thence a ruined man his father-in-law mr stevens assured palmer that there would not be four thousand shillings for those who had claims on his estate from the necessity he was under of raising money at an enormous discount we may easily infer that he was in desperate difficulties and that unless some sudden success on the turf should retrieve his fortunes his case was hopeless his health shattered his mind distracted he had long been cherishing the hope that polestar would win and so put him in possession of a sum amounting in stakes and winnings to something like a thousand guineas the mare it is true was hardly his own she had been mortgaged and if she should lose she would become the property of another person picture to yourself what must have been the condition mental and bodily of that young man when he rose from his bed on the morning of the races it is scarcely possible that as he went down to breakfast this thought must not have crossed his mind my fate is trembling in the balance 
this is the crisis of my destiny unless my horse shall win and give me one chance more of recovering myself to-night i am a beggar with these feelings he repairs to the race-course another race is run before polestar is brought out his impatience is extreme he looks on in a state of agonizing excitement will the minutes never fly at last arrives the decisive moment the time has come for the race the flag is dropped the horses start his mare wins easily and he her master has won a thousand guineas for three minutes he is not able to speak so intense is his emotion slowly he recovers his utterance and then how rapturous is his joy he is saved he is saved another chance to retrieve his position one chance more to recover his character and yet at all events he will not be a disgrace to his family and his friends conceive him to be with all his faults an honourable young man and you may easily imagine what his ecstasy must have been he loves the memory of his dead mother he still reverences the name of his father he is jealous of his sister's honour and it may be that he cherishes silently in his heart the thought of some other being dearer still than all to whom the story of his ruin would bring bitter anguish but he is not ruined he will meet his engagements like an honourable man there is now no danger of his being an outcast an adventurer a blackleg he will live to redeem his position and to give joy to those who love him with such thoughts in his heart he returns to his inn in a state of indescribable elation and with a revulsion from despair he must have convulsed though not in the sense of illness every fibre of his frame his first idea is to entertain his friends and he does so the evidence does not prove that he drank to excess but he gave a champagne dinner and we all know that it is a luxurious entertainment at which there is no stint and not much self-respect that evening he did not spend in the society of palmer indeed it is not clear in whose company he spent it but we find him on the evening of wednesday at the unicorn with saunders his trainer and a lady on thursday he walks upon the course and herring remonstrates with him for doing so as the day is damp and misty and the ground wet that night he is seized with illness and he continues ailing until his death at rugeley arrived at rugeley it is but natural to suppose that a reaction of feeling may have set in then the dark side of the picture may have presented itself to his imagination the chilling thought may have come upon him that his winnings were already forestalled and would scarcely suffice to save him from destruction it is when suffering from a weakened body and an irritated and excited mind he is attacked with a sickness which clings to his system leaves him without any rest incapacitates him from taking food distracts his nerves and places him in imminent danger of falling a victim to any sudden attack of convulsions to which he may have a predisposition he relished no society so much as that of palmer whose residence was immediately opposite the talbot arms inn where he was lying on his sick-bed for two nights he had been taking opiate pills prescribed by dr bamford on sunday night at twelve o'clock he started as from a dream in the state of the utmost excitement and alarm he admitted afterwards that for two minutes he was mad but could not ascribe to it anything unless to his having been awakened by a squabble in the street but do no such things happen to people of sound constitutions and regular habits do no such people awaken in agony and delirium because there is a noise under their windows no these are the afflictions of the dissipated and the anxious whose bodies are shattered and whose minds are distracted next day monday he was pretty well but not so well as to mount his horse or to take a walk in the fields he could converse with his trainer and jockey but he took no substantial food and drank not a drop of brandy and water you will bear in mind that palmer was not with him that day in the middle of the night he was seized with an attack similar in character to that of the night preceding but manifestly much milder for he retained his consciousness throughout it 
and was not mad for a moment the evidence of elizabeth mills is conclusive on the point the learned sergeant read some passages from the deposition of the witness in question at three o'clock on the following day tuesday mr jones the surgeon of lutworth arrived and spent a considerable time probably from three to seven o'clock in his company they had abundant opportunity for conversing confidentially and they were likely to have done so for they were very intimate and jones appears to have been on more familiar terms with cook than was any other person not even excepting mr stevens nothing occurred in the entire and unbounding confidence which must have existed between mr cook and mr jones to raise any suspicions in the minds of mr jones and at the consultation which took place between seven and eight o'clock on tuesday evening between jones palmer and bamford as to what the medicine for that evening should be the fit of the monday night was not mentioned that is a remarkable fact the crown may say that it is remarkable inasmuch as palmer knew it and said not a word about it but i think that it shows that the fit was so little serious in the opinion of cook that he did not think it worth mentioning to his intimate friend jones if cook had not given to elizabeth mills a rather exaggerated description of what had occurred would he not have said to mr jones when he came from lutterworth to see him you can't judge of my condition from my appearance now for i was in a state of perfect madness overnight and in fact i thought i was going to die evidently he would have said something of that sort and if he had mr jones would have mentioned it at the consultation my inference then is that the first statement which was made by elizabeth mills was the correct statement of what occurred palmer in the presence of jones administered two pills to mr cook which it is supposed poisoned him which contained a substance which sometimes does its deadly work in a quarter of an hour which has done it in less and which rarely exceeds half an hour and we are asked to believe that in spite of cook's objecting in the presence of his friends to take the pills palmer positively forced them down his throat at the imminent peril of the man falling down in a few minutes in convulsions evidently tetanic as in the course of the examination of mr jones the word tetanus was used it is right that i should say a word upon that subject the word tetanus is not in his deposition but i tell you what is in it and it is one of the most remarkable features of this case because it shows how people when they get a theory into their heads will fag that theory how they will stretch it to the very utmost and make it fit into the exact place in which they wish to put it we have it now in the evidence of dr taylor that at the inquest he sat next to mr dean the attorney's clerk and suggested the questions which it was necessary in his judgment to put in order to elicit the truth as to the symptoms of mr cook's disease now fancy dr taylor who had had a letter telling him that there was a suspicion of strychnine and who had all but made up his mind at that time to state positively upon oath his opinion that the pills given on monday and tuesday nights contain strychnine fancy the attorney-general i am sorry that my learned friend should be misled upon a matter of fact but i am told that dr taylor was not present when mr jones was examined mr shee continued then the observation which i was about to make does not apply and all i can say is that mr jones had probably in his mind's eye when he gave that evidence a recollection of what he had seen on the tuesday night he could not have seen very accurately however for he said that there was only one candle in the room and that he had not light enough to see the patient's face and that he could not tell whether there was much change in the countenance of the deceased a very important fact when the doctors all say that cook's disease cannot have been traumatic tetanus because there is always a peculiar expression on the countenance in those cases which was not observable in cook however mr jones who is a competent professional man gave his evidence and it is quite clear that the notion of tetanus must have entered into his mind because i find it in the depositions that the coroner's clerk first put down tetanus 
and the probability i think is that the disease did occur to mr jones at the time and that he used the word because the clerk never could have invented it then tetanus is struck out then the word convulsions is written and also struck out and as the sentence stands it is quote, there were strong symptoms of violent convulsions end quote. what is the fair inference from that why that the man who saw cook in the paroxysm did not think himself justified in saying that it was a titanic convulsion at all though it was very like tetanus now i will just call your attention to the features of general convulsions as described in cross-examination by the medical witnesses in order to show that the convulsions of which cook died were not tetanic properly speaking but were of that strong and irregular kind which cannot be classed under the head of tetanus either traumatic or idiopathic but under the head of general convulsions i propose upon this part of the case to read an extract from the work of dr copland which will enable you to judge whether cook's complaint bears a greater resemblance to general convulsions than to traumatic tetanus or strychnine tetanus before doing so however i would observe that the only persons who can be supposed to know anything of tetanus not traumatic are physicians and that not one of those most honourable class of men who see the attacks of patients in their beds and not in the hospital has been called by the crown with the exception of dr todd who is a most respectable man and who gave his evidence in such a way as to command the respect of every one but even his practice appears to be not so much that of a physician as of a surgeon i am instructed that i shall be able to show by the most eminent men in the profession that the description which i am about to read from dr copland's book the dictionary of practical medicine is the true description of general convulsions in that book i find the following under the head of convulsions quote, definition violent and involuntary contractions of a part or of the whole of the body sometimes with rigidity and tension tonic convulsions but more frequently with tumultuous agitations consisting of alternating shocks clonic convulsions that come on suddenly either in recurring or in distant paroxysms and after irregular and uncertain intervals End quote. the article then goes on quote, if we take the character of the spasm in respect of permanency rigidity relaxation and recurrence as a basis of arrangement of all the diseases attended by abnormal action of voluntary muscles we shall have every grade passing imperceptibly from the most acute form of tetanus through cramp epilepsy eclampsia convulsions etc down to the most atonic states of chorea and tremor End quote. as to the premonitory symptoms it says quote, the premonitory symptoms of general convulsions are inter alia vertigo and dizziness irritability of temper flushings or alternate flushing and paleness of the face nausea retching or vomiting or pain and distension of stomach and left hypochondrium unusual flatulence of the stomach and bowels or other dyspeptic symptoms end quote in further describing these convulsions the article says quote, in many instances the general sensibility and consciousness are but very slightly impaired particularly in the more simple cases and when the proximate cause is not seated in the encephalon but in proportion as this part is affected primarily or consecutively and the neck and face tumid and livid the cerebral functions are obscured and the convulsions attended by stupor delirium etc or rapidly pass into or are followed by these states End quote. then it adds quote, the paroxysm may cease in a few moments or minutes or continue for some or even many hours it generally subsides rapidly the patient experiencing at its termination fatigue headache or stupor but he is usually restored in a short time to the same state as before the seizure which is liable to recur in a person once affected but at uncertain intervals 
after repeated attacks the fit sometimes becomes periodic the convulsio recurrence of authors End quote. and in detailing the origin of these convulsions it says quote, the most common causes are inter alia all emotions of the mind which excite the nervous power and determine the blood to the head as joy anger religious enthusiasm excessive desire etc or those which greatly depress the nervous influence as well as diminish and derange the actions of the heart as fear terror anxiety sadness distressing intelligence frightful dreams etc the syphilitic poison and repulsion of gout or rheumatism end quote. do you believe if dr taylor had read that before the inquest that he would have dared to say that the man died from strychnine is there one single symptom in the statement made in the depositions by elizabeth mills and mr jones which may not be classed under one of the varieties of convulsions which dr copland describes it is not for me to suggest a theory but the gentlemen whom i shall call before you men of the highest eminence in their profession and not mere hospital surgeons who have seen nothing of this nature but traumatic tetanus will tell you that mr cook's symptoms were those of general convulsions and not of tetanus my belief is and i hope you will confirm it by your verdict that mr cook's complaint was not tetanus at all though it may well have been according to the descriptions to which i shall call your attention some form of traumatic or idiopathic tetanus there being no broad general distinction or certain confine between idiopathic or self-generating tetanus and many forms of convulsions the tetanic form of convulsions is pretty much the same thing as idiopathic tetanus and when we are told by medical witnesses that they never saw a case of idiopathic tetanus my answer to that is that they must have had very limited experience it is not a disease of very frequent occurrence it is true but there are gentlemen here who have seen cases of idiopathic tetanus and they are by no means that rare occurrence which has been represented to you by the witnesses for the prosecution there is one gentleman here of very large practice at leeds whom i shall call before you who attended at the bedside of mrs dove who has himself seen four cases of idiopathic tetanus traumatic tetanus very frequently occurs in hospitals in fact it often supervenes upon the operations of the surgeon but the persons to give you correct information upon idiopathic tetanus are the general practitioners who enjoy the confidence of families and who have the opportunity of visiting at their dwellings both rich and poor when they are attacked by any of those convulsive diseases or fits which heads of families and brothers and sisters are so careful not to disclose to the world at large dr watson is a general practitioner and he says in his lectures on the principles and practices of physic that most cases of tetanus may be traced to one or two causes which are exposure to the cold or sudden alternations of temperature and bodily injury it has been known to arise he says from causes so slight as these the sticking of a fishbone in the horses the air caused by a musket shot the stroke of a whiplash under the eye leaving the skin unbroken the cutting of a corn the biting of a finger by a tame sparrow the blow of a stick on the neck the insertion of a seton the extraction of a tooth the injection of a hydrocele the operation of cupping it goes on to say that when the disease arises from exposure to the cold or damp it comes on earlier than on other occasions often in a few hours so that if the exposure takes place in the night the complaint may begin to manifest itself next morning he also says that although tetanus may be occasioned by a wound independently of exposure to cold or by exposure to cold without bodily injury there is good reason for thinking that in many instances one of the causes would fail to produce it where both together would call it forth dr watson adds that although the pathology of tetanus is obscure we may fairly come to the conclusion that the symptoms are the result of some peculiar condition of the spinal cord 
produced and kept up by irritation of the substance and that the brain is not involved in the disease the modern french writers upon the disease hold that it is an inflammable complaint and that it consists essentially of inflammation of the spinal marrow now who shall say that these symptoms which were spoken to on the day of the inquest by elizabeth mills and mr jones may not be ranged under one of those forms of tetanus idiopathic tetanus is so like general convulsions that in many cases it cannot be distinguished from them and to such an extent is this so that dr copland states that convulsions frequently assume a tetanic appearance it is true that traumatic tetanus begins in four cases out of five by a seizure of the lower jaw but then in the fifth case it does not so commence and sir b brodie mentions two instances in which it began in the limb which was wounded now having gone so far and having endeavoured to satisfy you that the symptoms which were spoken to by those two witnesses in their depositions may be as i am told and instructed that they are rather referable to a violent description of general convulsions than to any form of tetanus let us proceed to inquire whether or not the symptoms are consistent with what we know of tetanus produced by strychnine because if you shall be satisfied upon full investigation that they are not consistent with the symptoms which are the unquestionable result of strychnia tetanus then the hypothesis of the crown entirely fails and john parsons cook can't have died of strychnine poisoning whether that be so or not will depend in a great degree as it strikes me although of course that will be for you to decide upon what you think of the evidence of elizabeth mills but before i go to that evidence i will call your attention to the description of strychnia tetanus as given by two very eminent gentlemen dr taylor and dr christison who were called for the crown the other day and if you find from their description that strychnia tetanus is a different thing from the picture first given of the attack and paroxysms by elizabeth mills and mr jones you will i think have great difficulty in determining that mr cook died from strychnine let us first take dr taylor's description of strychnia tetanus i am not sure whether he stated that he had ever seen a case of strychnia tetanus in a human subject but we must be just to dr taylor he has had large and extensive reading on the subject on which he writes and it is not to be supposed that he has set down in his book what he has not found established upon respectable authority therefore although we have it second-hand in the book we must suppose that dr taylor knows something of the subject in his work upon strychnine poisoning dr taylor says quote, that in from five to twenty minutes after the poison has been swallowed the patient is suddenly seized with tetanic symptoms affecting the whole of the muscular system the body becoming rigid the limbs stretched out and the jaws so fixed that the considerable difficulty is experienced in introducing anything into the mouth End quote. but according to the statement of the witnesses mr cook was sitting up in bed beating the bedclothes talking frequently telling the people about him to go for palmer asking for the remedy and ready to swallow whatever was given him there was no considerable difficulty in introducing anything into the mouth and the paroxysm instead of beginning within from five to twenty minutes after the poison was supposed to have been swallowed did not begin for an hour and a half afterwards dr taylor further on states quote, after several such attacks increasing in severity the patient dies asphyxiated End quote now i submit although there are some of these symptoms in this case as there will be in every case of violent convulsions that this is not a description of the case of john parsons cook the other medical authority to whom i said i should refer is dr christison he says that the symptoms produced by strychnine are very uncommon and striking the animal begins to tremble and is seized with stiffness and a starting of the limbs those symptoms increase till at length the animal is attacked by general spasms the fit is then succeeded by an interval of calm during which the senses are impaired or are unnaturally acute but another paroxysm soon sets in 
and then another and another until at last a fit occurs more violent than any that had preceded it and the animal perishes suffocated now who can say that that description at all tallies with the account of mr cook's symptoms i know exactly what dr christison means by this description because i had had the advantage of having had several experiments performed in my presence by dr leatherby which enabled me to understand it one of these experiments was this a dog had a grain of strychnine put into his mouth and for about twenty or twenty-five minutes he remained perfectly well suddenly he fell down upon his side and his legs were stretched out in a most violent way he was as stiff as it was possible to be in that state the dog remained with an occasional jerk for two or three minutes in a short time he recovered and got up but he appeared to be dizzy and uncomfortable and was afraid to move he shrunk and twitched and after another minute down he went again he got up again and fell down again and at last he had a tremendous struggle and then he died that is what dr christison means by his description if the dose had not been sufficient to kill the dog it would have been longer in producing an effect the paroxysms would have occurred at more distant intervals and they would have been less and less severe until the animal recovered but if the dose be strong enough to kill the interval between the paroxysms is short and at last one occurs which is strong enough to kill just before the animal dies the limbs become as supple and free as it is possible to conceive the limbs of an animal to be whichever way you put the limbs of the animal after it is quite dead the rigor mortis comes on after a time and they remain in any position in which they are placed i saw an experiment performed also upon two rabbits the symptoms were substantially the same the limbs of both of them were quite flaccid immediately upon death and during the intervals between the paroxysms the animals shuddered and were extremely touchy now gentlemen i will give you my reasons for saying that according to their own principle as adduced in evidence by the crown mr cook's death cannot have resulted from strychnia poison i object to the theory of it having resulted from strychnia poison first on the ground that no case can be found in the books in which while the paroxysms lasted the patient had so much command over the muscles of animal life and voluntary motion as mr cook had upon monday and tuesday night the evidence is that he was sitting up in his bed beating the bedclothes calling out and that so far from being afraid of people touching him he actually asked to have his neck rubbed and it was rubbed i now come to the next reason why we say that death in this case did not result from strychnine poison and i assert that there is no authentic case of tetanus from strychnine in which the paroxysm was delayed so long after the ingestion of the poison as it was in mr cook's case dr taylor says in page seventy four of his book that from five to twenty minutes after the poison has been swallowed the tetanic symptoms commence and then in support of this statement he proceeds to cite a number of cases one young lady was instantly deprived of the power of walking and fell down in the next case which was that of a girl tetanic symptoms came on in half an hour the next is a german case taken from the lancet and there a young man aged seventeen was attacked in about a quarter of an hour then there is the case of dr warner who took half a grain of sulphate of strychnine and died in fifteen minutes then there is the case of a young woman who took two or three drachms of nux vomica and died in between thirty and forty minutes another case is given of dr watson in his book which he himself observed in the middlesex hospital where strychnine pills intended for paralytic patients were taken by mistake one twelfth of a grain was intended to be administered every six hours but unluckily a whole grain was given at one time about seven o'clock in the evening and in half an hour it began to exhibit its effects dr watson says that any attempt at movement even touching the patient by another person brought on a recurrence of the symptoms 
it is clear then from all these cases that the interval which elapsed between the supposed ingestion of the poison and the commencement of the paroxysm was much too long three times too long to warrant the supposition that strychnia poison had been taken in this case thirdly i submit and i shall prove that there is no case in which the recovery from a paroxysm of strychnine poison has been so rapid as it was in cook's case upon monday night or in which a patient has endured so long an interval of repose or exemption from its symptoms afterwards in this case of mr cook according to the theory of the crown the paroxysms would not have been repeated at all if a second dose had not been given there was an end of it when elizabeth mills left palmer sleeping by the side of his friend in an armchair how easy would it have been then if he had been so disposed to administer another dose and to have hurried into elizabeth mills room and called out that cook was in another fit dr taylor says in his book that the patient is suddenly seized with spasms affecting the whole system and that after several such attacks increasing in severity the patient dies asphyxiated dr christison holds precisely the same language but i submit that here there is a broad distinction between the case of cook and that which these gentlemen state to be the distinguishing feature of the disease i now come to the post-mortem examination dr leatherby was good enough to dig up from his garden in order that i might see it an animal which had been killed by strychnine with a view to this inquiry a month before and to examine the heart before me the heart of that animal was quite full the heart also of the dog that was killed in my presence was quite full and so were the hearts of both the rabbits that i saw killed now i am told by a gentleman whom i shall call before you who is not afraid of dogs and remember that this is rather a matter for experiment than of theory i am told that the result of an enormously large proportion of such examinations and indeed of all of them if they are properly conducted is that the heart is invariably full at the same time i am told that if the examiners do the thing clumsily they may contrive to get an empty heart if there be any doubt in your minds however as to the heart being full in these cases i hope that some morning you will desire that a reasonable number of animals should be brought into one of the yards here and that you will see them die by strychnine and examine their hearts and form an opinion for yourselves i have now discussed what may be said to be the theory of these matters but i have not yet met the strong point which was made by the crown of the evidence of elizabeth mills i upon all occasions am most reluctant to attack a witness who is examined upon his or her oath and particularly if he be in a humble position of life i am very reluctant to impute perjury to such a person and i think that a man who has been as long in the profession as i have been must in most cases be put a little to his wit's end when he rushes upon the assumption that a person whose statements have after a considerable lapse of time materially varied is therefore necessarily deliberately perjured the truth is we know perfectly well that if a considerable interval of time occurs between the first story and the second story and if the intelligent and respectable persons who are anxious to investigate the truth but who still have a strong moral conviction upon imperfect information of the guilt of an accused person will talk to witnesses and say was there anything of this kind or anything of that kind the witnesses at last catch hold of the phrase or opinion that you should form of that witness the witnesses at last catch hold of the phrase or term which has been so often used to them and having in that way adopted it they fancy that they may tell it in court this might have been the case with elizabeth mills and let me point out to you what occurs to me to be the right opinion that you should form of that witness i submit to you that in this case of life and death or indeed in any case involving a question of real importance to liberty or to property that young woman's evidence would not be relied on in the ordinary administration of justice in the civil courts 
if a person has upon material points told two different stories juries are rarely willing to believe that person and in criminal cases the learned judges without altogether rejecting the evidence point out to the jury the discrepancies which have taken place and submit whether under all the circumstances it would be safe to rely upon the testimony last given differing from the statement which was made when the impression was fresh upon the witness's mind it cannot be said in this case that elizabeth mills was not fully and fairly examined i submit that my learned friend the attorney-general really made a false point the most unfortunate in the course of the prosecution in attacking upon this ground the coroner mr ward just place yourselves gentlemen for a moment in the position of the coroner and to enable you the better to do so just recollect what has passed in the course of this trial in this court recollect if you can how many questions have been put by my learned friends and by me on account of which it has been necessary for counsel to interpose and to ask the learned judges whether the question was a proper one our rules of examination are strict but they are most beneficial because they exclude from the minds of the jury that loose and general sort of information which in country towns especially is the subject of pothouse stories and market gossip and substitute for it the evidence of actual facts which have been seen and are deposed to by the witnesses imagine the coroner in a large room at a tavern just under the bedroom where poor cook died a crowd of excited villagers in the room all full of suspicion produced by the inquiries of the prince of wales insurance office about walter palmer and inspector field there and inspector simpson and all impressed with the belief that whatever the london doctor said must be true and that if dr alfred swain taylor had made up his mind that it was poison poison it was the whole town was in a state of uproar and excitement every question that occurred to everybody must be put before the coroner did you hear so-and-so didn't somebody tell you that someone had said so-and-so and so on how is it possible under such circumstances to conduct an inquiry with the dignity and decorum that are observed in the superior courts there was a celebrated trial some years ago in france in which i remember to have taken great interest of the ministers of king charles x upon that occasion one witness actually proved that he had read all the pamphlets that had been published on the subject and he came forward to state what upon the whole was the result which those pamphlets had made upon his mind it is true that this was in revolutionary times but it shows to what an extent the introduction of a loose system of questioning may go i don't say that dr taylor suggested any but proper questions but you must consider the difficulties under which the coroner had to labour but i am told that he is an exceedingly good lawyer and a most respectable man dr taylor said that the coroner's omission to ask questions arose in his opinion rather from want of knowledge than from intention of course the coroner would not be likely to know the proper questions to put in such a case but when he did know them he seems to have put them he was right in refusing to put irrelevant questions to gratify an inquisitive juryman we are ourselves constantly being rebuked by the learned judges and told to adhere to the rules and not to put questions which are irrelevant End of section 14section 15 of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson section 15 the defence seventh day continued i have now pointed out such discrepancies in the evidence given by mills before the coroner and before you as will i think make it clear to you that you cannot rely upon her testimony since she first gave her evidence she has had the means of knowing what is the case on the part of the crown i do not mean to say she has been tutored by the crown 
i believe that my learned friend would not have called her if he thought she had but she has had the opportunity of discovering by interviews with several different people that the case for the prosecution is that palmer having first prepared the body of cook for deadly poison by the poison of antimony afterwards dispatched him with the deadly poison of strychnine their case is that there was an administration of something which had the effect of producing retching nausea and irritation of the stomach those symptoms are therefore attributed to the persevering intention of the prisoner to reduce cook to such a state of weakness that when once ingestion of the poison occurred he was sure to be carried off in her evidence before the coroner she was asked whether she had tasted the broth she said she had and she thought it very good she did not then say anything about the ill effects the broth had produced but she has since learnt that it is part of the case of those out of whose hands the crown has taken the prosecution and that it is the theory of dr taylor that all this retching and vomiting was the result of a constant dosing with antimonial poison she has probably been frequently asked whether she was not sick after drinking the broth perhaps she may have been sick on some sunday or other and she has persuaded herself for i do not wish to impute perjury to her that she was made sick by the two tablespoonfuls of broth which she drank it is not to the last degree incredible that a shrewd intelligent man like palmer should have exposed himself to such a chance of detection as sending broth which he had poisoned from his house to stand by the kitchen fire of the talbot arms when sure as fate the cook would taste it did you ever know a cook who would not taste broth sent by another person and said to be particularly good it is not in the nature of things a cook is a taster she tastes everything and palmer must have known that as sure as ever he sent into the kitchen broth containing antimony the cook would take it and be ill her statement is not credible and cannot be relied on then she said in her evidence before the coroner that on saturday cook had coffee and vomited directly he swallowed it and that up to the time she gave him the coffee she had not seen palmer she was not then aware that the theory of the gradual preparation of the body by antimony was to fit into the theory of death from strychnine but by the time she came here she had become acquainted with that part of the case my learned friend stated that palmer ordered him to drink coffee on saturday morning it was brought in by the chambermaid elizabeth mills and given to the prisoner who had an opportunity of tampering with it before giving it to cook there is all the difference between this statement of my learned friend and that first made by mills before the coroner but the young woman did not go quite so far as that she went however to this extent palmer came over at eight o'clock and ordered a cup of coffee for cook i gave it to him i believe palmer was in the bedroom at the time i did not see him drink it i observed afterwards that the coffee had been vomited her statement was not so strong as that of my learned friend but a great deal stronger than the one she made before the coroner the two statements are essentially different and the difference between them consists in this the one supports the theory suggested by the prosecution the other is totally inconsistent with it can you rely on a woman who makes such alterations in her testimony that is not all the case suggested for the crown now is that cook expressed reluctance to take the pills ordered for him and that his reluctance was overruled by palmer mills's first statement was that cook said the pills made him ill here she said that the pills which palmer gave him made him ill before the coroner too she did not say that palmer was in the bedroom between nine and ten on monday night as she has stated here she makes him more about the bedside of the man she gives him a greater opportunity of administering pills and medicine she shows an animus the result according to the most charitable construction that can be put upon it of a persuasion that palmer must be guilty but still an animus which shows that she is not to be relied on 
how easily may persons in her condition make mistakes without intending to deceive it is the just punishment of old falsehood that when a lie has once been told it cannot be retracted without humiliation and when once this young woman had been induced to vary her statement in a material particular she had not the moral courage to set herself right but the particulars i have mentioned are nothing to those to which i will now call your attention i impeach her testimony on the ground that she here gesticulated and gave her evidence in such a manner that if it had been natural and she had adopted it at the inquest it must have attracted the attention of dr taylor the remarkable contortions into which she put her hands her mouth and her neck would if they had been observed at the inquest have been reduced to verbal expression and recorded in the depositions i am told by dr nunnally dr robinson and other gentlemen that the symptoms she described are inconsistent with any known disease there was an extraordinary grouping of symptoms some of them quite consistent with tetanus produced by strychnine administered under peculiar circumstances others quite inconsistent with it now in the last week of february a frightful case of strychnine occurred in leeds a person having the means of access to the bedside of a patient was supposed to have administered small doses day by day and after keeping her for some time in a state of irritation to have at last killed her the person who attended the patient spoke of her symptoms for about a week before her death and said she had twitchings in the legs that she was alarmed at being touched in the intervals between the spasms i will now call your attention to the evidence of mills she states quote, cook said i can't lie down i shall be suffocated if i lie down oh fetch mr palmer the last words he said very loud i did not observe his legs but there was a sort of jumping or jerking about his head and neck and the body sometimes he would throw back his head upon the pillow and then raise it up again he had much difficulty in breathing the balls of his eyes projected very much he screamed again three or four times while i was in the room he was moving and knocking about all the time he asked me to rub his hands i did rub them and he thanked me i noticed him twitch i gave him toast and water his body was still jerking and thumping when i put the spoon in his mouth he snapped at it and got it fast between his teeth and seemed to bite at it very hard in snapping at the spoon he threw forward his head and neck he swallowed the toast and water and with it the pills palmer then handed him a draught in a wine glass cook drank this he snapped at the glass as he had done at the spoon he seemed as though he could not exactly control himself End quote. the expressions she used particularly the word twitching are remarkable it may well be that when this case became public she may have had her attention called to it and then had questions put to her with regard to the symptoms of cook which induced her to alter the evidence she had before given i cannot otherwise account for the remarkable variance in her evidence from the time she left the talbot arms till she came here she seems to have been a person of remarkable importance she went to dolly's where stevens visited her five or six times what for stevens was unquestionably and within proper limits he is not to be blamed for it indignant at the circumstances of cook's death he is not in the same condition of life as mills why did he call on her why did he converse with her in a private room he came she said to inquire after her health and see how she liked london mr gardiner also saw her in the street but he only asked her how she was and talked of other things i do not say that these gentlemen went to her with the deliberate intention of inducing her to say what was false but they did go with the deliberate intention of stimulating her memory upon points as to which they thought it required stimulating mr hatton the police officer of rugeley also saw her a few times they could have gone to her for no purpose but that of taking her evidence i may mention a circumstance which shows how differently minor matters may be stated by witnesses who do not wish to assert what is false when palmer went into the bedroom after being called up he remarked i do not think i ever dressed so quickly in my life and it is suggested that he never went to bed 
but waited up for the commencement of the paroxysm mills answered the question i put to her upon that point pretty fairly she said he came in his dressing-gown and i do not recollect that there was anything like a day-shirt about his neck on the other hand lavinia barnes who gave her evidence in a most respectable manner said that he was quite dressed that he wore his usual dress people get talking about what they have witnessed the real image of what occurred becomes confused or altogether obliterated from their minds and they at last unconsciously tell a story which is very different from the truth mills was examined three times before the coroner and if that officer acted improperly on those occasions it was quite competent for the crown to bring him here and give him an opportunity of vindicating himself but he ought not to be blamed upon the evidence of a witness like her in the course of her examination however there came out a fact which is worthy of remark is there not something extraordinary in the periodicity of the attacks she described in their recurrence on three nights nearly at the same hour there are numerous cases in the books in which attacks of this kind occurred at the same distance of time after the patient has gone to bed without going into unnecessary details i will now state what i intend to prove upon this part of the case i shall call a great number of most respectable medical practitioners and surgeons in general practice with a large experience in great cities who will support the theory that these fits of cook were probably not tetanus at all but violent convulsions the result of a weak habit of body increased by a careless mode of life by at least a sufficient amount of disease to render violent mineral poisons in their opinion desirable and by habits which led to a chronic ulceration of the tonsils and difficulty in swallowing they will prove that men with constitutions weakened by indulgence have often under the influence of strong mental excitement and violent emotion of any kind been suddenly thrown into such a state of convulsion that symptoms have been exhibited in the voluntary muscles of violent disease and that persons suffering from those symptoms have constantly died asphyxiated or of exhaustion leaving no trace whatever as to the cause of death in addition i will call several gentlemen who will speak to experiments they have made upon animals who will be ready to show you those experiments in any yard belonging to this building if my lords should think fit they will tell you on the authority of orphila that no degree of putrescence will decompose strychnine and that if it is in the body they will be sure to find it even now lord campbell said that the court could not see the experiments made but witnesses might be called to prove them mr sergeant she i have now done with that branch of the case and will proceed to the last matter to which i propose to direct your attention i propose to discuss whether the circumstantial evidence is inexplicable on the supposition of the prisoner's innocence and if i show you that in all its broad and salient features it is not so i am sure that you will be only too happy to acquit him recollecting that you represent the country which is uninformed upon the case which has no opportunity of hearing the witnesses on either side lord campbell in the language of the law which country you are mr sergeant she which country you are you are responsible not to render this kingdom liable to the charge of having in a paroxysm of prejudice propagated by a professional man with no knowledge of his own upon the matter condemned an innocent person in discussing the circumstantial evidence i will avoid no point that seems at all difficult but not to waste time i will not after the intimation which i have received from the bench trouble you with such matters as the pushing against dr devonshire during the post-mortem examination or the cutting of a slit in the cover of the jar which might be done accidentally with any of the sharp instruments which were being used or the putting it at the further end of the room lord campbell what was said referred only to the pushing mr sergeant she i take leave to suggest that in an examination in the town of rugeley where palmer was perfectly well known the fact of there having been a little apparent shoving which may for the moment have disturbed the operator 
is not to be allowed to have weight against the prisoner especially as mr devonshire said nothing was lost the matter was one in which all present took considerable interest and a little leaning over might easily have produced the effect which was spoken to then as to the removal of the jar it was not taken out of the room it could not have been taken away without its removal being observed and it would have been to the last degree foolish for any guilty person to attempt to remove it that a man who knew himself to be innocent should be very unwilling that the jar should be removed out of the hands of persons upon whom he could rely for honest dealing is very probable palmer knew that there were some persons who did not want to pay him thirteen thousand pounds and who had for a long time been doing all they could to undermine his character and to put to him most wicked conduct with regard to the death of a relation suspicions in which none of his relatives had joined it is clear from his observation quote, well doctor they won't hang us yet end quote, that he knew that it was intended to ground a suspicion or a complaint upon the post-mortem examination and it was exceedingly natural that he should like to have the jar kept in safe custody even in the crowded room all his conduct is consistent with this explanation to dr harland with whom he does not appear to have been particularly intimate he says quote, i am very glad you are come because there is no knowing who might have done it End quote. that is the conduct of a respectable man who knew that his conduct would bear investigation if it were properly conducted i dare say there are in rugeley many excellent and very serious people to whom the prisoner's habits of life his running about to races and so on would not much recommend him and who he had reason to know entertained prejudices against him as to his objection to the jar being taken to mr frere's there had i believe been some slight difference arising out of thirlby's palmer's assistant having come to him from mr frere i do not do mr frere the injustice to think that this slight dispute would have led him to put anything into the jar but it may account for palmer's caution let us now come to the more prominent features of palmer's conduct upon which in accordance with instructions my learned friend principally relied i will first call your attention to the evidence of myatt the postboy at the talbot arms mr stevens had come down from london and had acted towards palmer in such a way as would have induced some men to kick him assuming palmer to be innocent stevens's conduct was most provoking he dissembled with palmer cross-questioned him pretended to take his advice scolded him in a harsh tone of voice almost insulted him threatened a post-mortem examination and acted throughout under the impression that some one had been guilty of foul play towards cook which ought to be brought to light and punished stevens had been there during the whole of the post-mortem examination a gloomy miserable day it must have been poring over the remains of that poor dead man the jar was ready and the fly was at the door to take himself and boycott to stafford in order that this jar might be sent to london out of palmer's ken and notice so that if there was anybody base enough to do it either in support of a theory or to maintain a reputation god forbid that i should suggest that to the prejudice of dr taylor i do not mean to do so but if there was anybody capable of acting so great a wickedness it might be done and it was but a reasonable concern that palmer should be anxious that it should stop at dr harland's he did not like its going with stevens to london stevens had been particularly troublesome he had been vexatious and annoying to the last degree the fly was ready when palmer met myatt the postboy and learned that he was going to drive mr stevens to stafford according to myatt's evidence palmer then asked him if he would upset them that word was first used in this court to designate the jars but as there was at that time but one jar it must have been intended to apply to mr stevens and his companion 
palmer's conduct to stevens had been most exemplary and he must have been irritated to the last degree to find that he was suspected of stealing a paltry betting book which was of no use to any one and of having played foully and falsely with the life of his friend the deceased that he was much annoyed was proved by his observation to dr harland in the morning Quote, there has been a queer old fellow down here making inquiries who seems to suspect that everything is wrong he thinks i have stolen a betting book which every one who knows anything knows can be of no use to any one now that poor cook is dead End quote. this shows that palmer's mind was impressed with the sense that stevens had ill-treated him he no doubt said to himself he stevens has encouraged and brought back suspicions which have well nigh destroyed me already and which if he proceeds in this course of bringing another charge against me will probably render it impossible to get the sum which would be sufficient to release me from my embarrassments in this state of mind palmer met the postboy who was ready to drive mr stevens to stafford what occurred then was thus described by myatt Quote, he said he supposed i was going to take the jars what did you say then or what did he say i said i believed i was after you said you believed you were what did he say he says do you think you could upset them what answer did you make i told him no did he say anything more he said if i could there was a ten pound note for me what did you say to that i told him i should not did he say any more to you i told him that i must go for the horse was in the fly waiting for me to start End quote. in cross-examination he was asked quote, were not these the words palmer used i should not mind giving ten pounds to break mr stevens's neck i do not recollect him saying to break his neck were they not words to that effect i should not mind giving him ten pounds to break his neck i do not recollect that then ten pounds to upset him yes those were the words were they them were the words to the best of my recollection did he appear to have been drinking at the time i cannot say when he said to upset him did he use any epithet did he describe him in any way such as upset the fellow he did not describe him in any way did he say anything about him at the time he did say something about it it was a humbugging concern or something to that effect that he was a humbugging concern was that it no that it was a humbugging concern or something to that effect yes End quote. i submit to you that after this evidence you can only regard this expression about upsetting them in its milder and more innocent sense as a strong expression used by a man vexed and irritated by the suspicious and inquisitive manner which stevens had from the first exhibited that this is the correct view of the matter is confirmed by the fact that at the time of the inquest nothing was known of this and myatt was not called myatt was engaged at the talbot arms and must frequently have conversed about the death of cook and the post-mortem examination with servants and other persons about that inn had any serious weight been attached to this offer of palmer it would have excited attention and would have been given in evidence before the coroner on the other hand it is to the last degree improbable that a medical man knowing that he had given a large dose of strychnine with the violent properties of which he was well acquainted should have supposed that by the accidental spilling of a jar the liver spleen and some of the tissues remaining behind he could possibly escape detection i will next call your attention to the evidence of charles newton who swore that he saw palmer at mr salt's surgery at nine o'clock on monday night when he gave him three grains of strychnine in a piece of paper he did not bring this to the knowledge of the crown until the night before this trial commenced he was examined before the coroner but although then called to corroborate the statement of roberts as to the presence of palmer at hawkins's shop where he was said to have purchased strychnine he then said nothing about the purchase on the monday night a man who so conducts himself 
who when first sworn omits a considerable portion of what he tells three weeks afterwards and again comes forward at the last moment and tells more than enough in his opinion to drive home the guilt of the person who is accused that man is not to be believed upon his oath there are other circumstances which render newton's statement in the highest degree improbable that palmer should once in a way purchase strychnine in rugeley is not to be wondered at it is sold to kill vermin to kill dogs and whatever the evidence as to the galloping of the mares and the dropping their foals it shows that palmer had occasion for it and for other purposes but that having bought enough for all ordinary purposes he should go and buy more the next day and should purchase it at the shop of a tradesman with whom he had dealt for two years is in the highest degree incredible nobody would believe it nobody can or ought to believe it but observe this also palmer had been in london on the monday and in london there is no difficulty in procuring strychnine it is sold to any one who by writing down the technical description of what he wants shows that he has had a medical education why did he not get it in london and if he could not get it in london why did he not get it at stafford or at any of the other places to which he had been if he had bought it for this guilty purpose would he not as a wary man have taken care that when his house was searched there should be found in it the paper containing the exact quantity of strychnine which he had purchased what could have been easier to do than that newton's story therefore cannot be believed but in addition i will show that palmer who is stated by herring to have been in london at a quarter past three o'clock could not have been in rugeley at the time at which newton says he was at mr salt's palmer attended the post-mortem examination and is it credible that he a skilful medical man who studied in a london hospital and made a note upon one of his books to the effect of strychnine would ask that stupid sort of fellow newton anything about its action upon a dog and would when the answer was given snap his fingers and say it is all right then it cannot be found no one will believe it for a moment the animus of newton is shown by his admitting the word poor and representing palmer as having said you will find this fellow suffering from a disease of the throat he has had syphilis and then when cross-examined upon the subject by my learned friend mr grove replying i don't know whether he said poor or rich as if that had anything to do with the question i will now take you back to what occurred at shrewsbury the case for the crown is that as early as wednesday the fourteenth november the scheme of poisoning cook had begun to be executed at shrewsbury it is suggested that cook was dosed with something that was put into his brandy and water you will remember that i read to you a letter from cook to fisher dated the sixteenth of november to which there is this postscript quote, i am better end quote that must have referred to his illness at shrewsbury it is the postscript to a letter in which he speaks of the object he has in view which is of great importance to himself and palmer is his writing in that tone consistent with his having a belief that palmer had drugged him with poison for the purpose of destroying his life at shrewsbury what did palmer say about it Quote, cook says i have put something in his glass I don't play such tricks. End quote. He treated it as though it had never been understood to be more than the expression of a man who, if not actually drunk, was very nearly so. Palmer did not arrive at the Raven until after the dinner hour. We have no evidence how Cook fared there, but we shall be able to prove that he went from there to the Unicorn, where he arrived pretty flush and where he sat drinking brandy and water with saunders the trainer and a lady seven or eight glasses of brandy and water did this good young man drink and the result was that his unfortunate syphilitic throat was in a very dreadful state if not of actual laceration at least of soreness and irritation the learned sergeant here 
read to the jury a long extract from an article which had appeared in some newspaper which he did not mention in which the occurrences at shrewsbury were described in a style which seemed intended to be humorous and in which cook's sickness was attributed to his having taken too much brandy upon champagne in order to restore his british solidity the learned sergeant said that this entirely concurred with his own view of the case he then continued cook's own conduct afterwards proved that his illness was owing to his having drunk too much he got up in the morning breakfasted with palmer was good friends with him and went with him to rugeley they received pratt's letter of the thirteenth in consequence of which palmer wrote to pratt to say that some one would call upon him and pay him two hundred pounds and cook wrote to fisher and asked him to call on pratt and pay this money does that look as though he thought there had been an attempt to poison him mrs brooks who gave her evidence in a most creditable manner proved that there was much sickness among the strangers who were at shrewsbury and the rest of her evidence did not tell much against palmer who might after cook's complaint very naturally have been looking at the tumbler to see if anything had been put into it cook got worse and at last had the good sense to put his money into fisher's hands and go to bed he was still very sick and a doctor was sent for who recommended an emetic cook made himself sick by drinking warm water and putting the handle of a toothbrush down his throat he took a pill and a black draught went to sleep and next morning was quite well this is really too ludicrous to receive a moment's consideration a person named myatt was in the room at the raven all the evening he has been put into the box but i shall call him and you will hear his account palmer and cook having got back to rugeley the history of the slow poisoning continues they were there together and probably talked on the way of their difficulties and the mode of getting out of them and of the small way that the winnings at shrewsbury would go to effect that object both seeing ruin staring them in the face unless the prince of wales insurance office could be made to pay the money which was due and they could meanwhile remain free from all suspicion of insolvency or any sort of misconduct when they got to rugeley they provided for the temporary difficulty by sending two hundred pounds to pratt they were then evidently on friendly terms cook's winnings being at palmer's service and probably both effecting their objects because as it would appear from what palmer said cook had some interest in the bills which were outstanding probably his name might not be upon them but as they were engaged in these racing transactions were joint owners of one horse and had the same trainer they were very probably equally interested in these bills were in fact what i remember to have once heard a nobleman well known upon the turf call confederates the frequency of palmer's visits to cook during the illness of the latter at rugeley affords no ground of suspicion against the prisoner on the contrary it tells in his favour cook had no friend in the town but palmer with whom he may almost be said to have been on a visit for though he did not sleep in palmer's house palmer was in continual attendance on him and owing to the close proximity of his own residence was enabled to bring him many little delicacies not easily obtainable at an inn had he neglected the sick man and only visited him occasionally the inference of the crown would probably have been that he was a black-hearted scoundrel who only looked in now and then to give him his poison but as he was zealously and laboriously attentive to him the conclusion is that he must have murdered him it is said that palmer was guilty of a falsehood in representing cook as suffering from diarrhoea and that is to put a very violent and a very uncharitable construction on his words for you remember that bamford swore to cook having told him that his bowels had been affected once or twice that his bowels had been affected twice or three times on sundays but leaving these minor points i come to one which in this case of circumstantial evidence is of the very last importance and should be deemed decisive of the prisoner's innocence the supposition of the crown is that palmer intended to dose cook with antimony to keep his stomach in continual irritation by vomiting 
in order that he might the more surely dispatch him with strychnine and that during sunday the day on which he insisted on his taking the broth cook was under the influence of this insidious treatment now supposing this to be true and assuming it to be the fact that palmer was indeed bent upon destroying cook by this singular process is it not manifest that there is one man who of all the men in the world would have been the very last whom he would have selected to be a witness of his proceedings that man is a surgeon in the prime of life a man intimately acquainted with cook and very much attached to him mr jones of lutterworth yet this is the very man to whom when he is about to set out for london palmer writes a letter informing him that cook is ill and urging him to come over and see him without delay i entreat of you to appreciate the full importance of that fact the more you think of it the more profound will become your conviction that it affords evidence irrefragable of palmer's innocence the imputation is that palmer meant to kill cook to possess himself of his winnings who was with cook when the race was won who was by his side on the shrewsbury racecourse for the three minutes that he was speechless who saw him take out his pocket-book and count up his winnings who but jones jones was his bosom friend his companion his confidant and who knew to the last farthing the amount of his gains jones was of all men living the most likely to be the recipient of cook's confidence and the man who was bound by every consideration of honour friendship and affection to protect him to vindicate his cause and to avenge his death yet this was the man for whom palmer sent that he might converse with cook receive his confidences minister to him in his illness and even sleep in the same room with him how if palmer is the murderer they represent him are you to account for his summoning jones to the bedside of the sick man if cook really suspected which we are assured he did that palmer was poisoning him jones was the man to whom he would most willingly have unbosomed himself and in whose faithful ear he would have eagerly disburdened the perilous stuff that weighed upon his own brain palmer and jones were both medical men and it is not improbable that in the course of his studies the latter may have noted in his class-book the very passages respecting the operation of strychnine which also attracted the attention of the former is it conceivable that if palmer meant to slay cook with poison in the dead of the night he would have previously ensured the presence in his victim's bedroom of a medical witness who would know from the symptoms that the man was not dying a natural death he brings a medical man into the room and makes him lie within a few inches of the sick man's bed that he may hear his terrific shrieks and witness those agonizing convulsions which indicate the fatal potency of poison can you believe it he might have dispatched him by means that would have defied detection for cook was taking morphia medicinally and a grain or two more would have silently thrown him into an eternal sleep but instead of doing so he sends to lutterworth for jones you have been told that this was done to recover appearances done to cover appearances no 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 you cannot believe it it is not in human nature it cannot be true you cannot find him guilty you dare not find him guilty on the suspicion of its truth the country will not stand by you if you believe it to be true you will be impeached before the world if you say that it is true i believe in my conscience that it is false and that consistently with the rules that govern human nature it cannot possibly be true sensation and murmurs of applause with respect to the interviews and dialogues that took place between the prisoner and mr stevens i contend that so far from telling against the former they are in his favour there is nothing but the evidence of a kind and considerate nature in the fact of his having ordered a shell and a strong oak coffin for the deceased 
nor is it possible to torture into a presumption of guilt the few words of irritation that may have fallen from the prisoner in the course of a conversation in which mr stevens treated him with scorn not to say insolence with respect to the betting book many persons had access to cook's room servants both men and women undertaker's men and barbers and though i do not venture to mark out any particular person for suspicion any one of them may have purloined the book and been afraid to return it it is not fair in a case of this momentous importance to affix the opprobrium on a man who is not proved to have ever had it in his hand the crown had no doubt originally intended to rely upon the prisoner's medical books as affording damning proof of his guilt but i will refer to those volumes for evidences that will speak eloquently in his favour in youth and early manhood there was no such protection for a man as the society of an innocent and virtuous woman to whom he is sincerely attached if you find a young man devoted to such a woman loving her dearly and marrying her for the love he bears her you may depend upon it that he is a man of a humane and gentle nature little prone to deeds of violence to such a woman was palmer attached in his youth and i will bring you proof positive to show that the volumes cited against him were the books he used when a student and that the manuscript passages are in the handwriting of his wife his was a marriage of the heart he loved that young and virtuous woman with a pure and generous affection he loved her as he now loves her firstborn who awaits with trembling anxiety the verdict that will restore him to the arms of his father or drive that father to an ignominious death upon the scaffold the prisoner here covered his face with his hands and shed tears here in this book i have conclusive evidence of the kind of man that palmer was seven years ago i find in its pages the copy of a letter addressed by him while still a student to the woman whom he afterwards made his wife it is as follows quote, my dearest annie i snatch a moment from my studies to write to your dear dear little self i need scarcely say that the principal inducement i have to work is the desire of getting my studies finished so as to be able to press your dear little form in my arms with best best love believe me dearest annie your own william End quote. now this is not the sort of letter that is generally read in courts of justice it was no part of my instructions to read that letter but the book was put in to prove that this man is a wicked heartless savage desperado and i will show what he was seven years ago that he was a man who loved a young woman for her own sake loved her with a pure and virtuous affection such an affection as would in almost all natures be a certain antidote against guilt such is the man whom it has been my duty to defend upon this occasion and upon the evidence that is before you i cannot believe him to be guilty don't suppose gentlemen that he is unsupported in this dreadful trial by his family and his friends an aged mother who may have disapproved of some part of his conduct awaits with trembling anxiety your verdict a dear sister can scarcely support herself under the suspense which now presses upon her a brave and gallant brother stands by to defend him and spares neither time nor trouble to save him from an awful doom i call upon you gentlemen to raise your minds to a capacity to estimate the high duty which you have to perform you have to stem the torrent of prejudice you have to vindicate the honour and character of your country you have with firmness and courage to do your duty and to find a verdict for the crown if you believe that guilt is proved but if you have a doubt on that point depend upon it that the time will come when the innocence of that man will be made apparent and then you will deeply regret any want of due and calm consideration of the case which it has been my duty to lay before you the speech of the learned sergeant occupied exactly eight hours in its delivery 
there were some slight indications of an attempt to applaud at its conclusion but they were instantly repressed the court then adjourned till ten o'clock next morning End of section fifteen